so again, uh, welcome back. And every semester uh, when I teach my classes, even if it's uh, a class that I've taught in the past, uh, I like to uh, have something new and interesting uh, associated with each incarnation of the class and every year uh, that changes. And so I'm still uh, shopping around for this class uh, for an appropriate uh, project uh, domain uh, that's different from uh, last time. Last year uh, we did computer vision application and specifically image classification. And so I might try something with video or maybe some health sensor, uh, but that remains to be seen at this juncture. Okay, so as I said, um, project one is due a week from today. Please make sure uh, you look at it uh, today. Um, it is um, very straightforward and it's to get you in the mindset of looking at a real data set and a real data set description uh, because that's really important. Part of data analytics, which is sort of the companion uh, to stochastic computing, um, part of uh, doing data analytics is understanding the data you have. Now, of course, in real terms, data can be very messy. And oftentimes you're given a description if it's called from places like the US Census and so forth, uh, but very often you have to put together this data set uh, yourself. And so this is to kind of wet your uh, feet, so to speak, dip your toe in the pool, uh, so to speak, uh, in getting used to looking at data sets uh, that aren't necessarily uh, the most straightforward. And so um, it will involve uh, visualization and a map, uh, making your own choice and then finding uh, relevant data uh, from a data set uh, published, I think it was by the IRS. Okay. All right, any questions about this? No, so please look at it. It's up live as of uh, last night. Uh, so uh, please do make sure you get on that right away. Okay, so the world around us is saturated with data. Right, And there's a lot of different sources of data. Uh, you have traditional data that you might get uh, called from a computer or some sort of uh, database of records. Uh, you imagine, you know, if you, anyone shop at Target and you have this Target Circle app, right? Well, they're not just being friendly, giving you coupons out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, they're really collecting a lot of purchase data. And so one of the uses of customer purchase data, so-called market basket data, is to try to discern what um, customer behavior is. Because if you can get a clear understanding of what your customers buy and when they buy things, uh, you can certainly try to improve or increase the amount of revenue or decrease the amount of loss uh, that uh, an organization uh, incurs. And so, for example, uh, if uh, someone is a young family, right? Someone uh, just has a child. I remember uh, seven and a half years ago uh, when my daughter was born, we bought different things than we buy uh, now that she's seven and a half, right? Uh, before she was born, we bought different things. So you can absolutely try to predict or determine what sort of stage of life uh, someone is, a customer or a group of customers or a household is based on their purchase behavior. And sometimes supermarkets will use this uh, and print out custom coupons uh, based on your customer behavior. So for example, if people who um, buy a lot of salad greens or what have you, and just making up the example, typically buy salad dressing together, well, if someone buys a head of lettuce, they'll say, gosh, well, what group of people does this purchaser most behave like? right, over time. And when you have this card, like the target circle or this account, this identity, they can now associate your behavior over time with a particular person, right, and get a lot more uh, rich information. Um, smart meters, I remember about 10 years ago in Delaware, uh, there was a big push to install so-called smart meters. They're these power meters uh, that deliver electricity into the home. Now, typically these meters just give a reading of the number of kilowatt hours, a uh, measure of electrical power uh, that a house is consuming. But the so-called smart meters also send out information as well as can receive information in the form of commands. And so what these smart meters do is that they allow the power company to ratchet up and ratchet down or regulate the amount of power that a particular house can consume. Now, the reason why that's important in peak times of the year, like say, let's uh, say it's a 100 degree day, a lot of people have their air conditioning turned on. Well, rather than have a brownout, meaning that there's not left 
enough electricity to go around and the electricity just stops in some regions, what they can do is say, okay, well, we're going to ratchet down just a little bit the amount of power each person uh, can consume uh, so that there's more power to go around for everyone for critical uses. Um, so smart meters, uh, there's a lot of data associated with that. And if you think about what happens, the power consumption, you can tell a lot about what's happening. Maybe someone's a student. They're not home during the day because they're at class, but at nighttime, they're up studying. So the power consumption from all the computers and tablets and other things people are using would be higher at certain times of the day and certain periods uh, of the year. So by collecting that data, the power company not only can optimize the power consumption, but can predict or say something, make a statement from all that data about how power is used and perhaps maybe pull in other power sources uh, to satisfy that power need when it's most needed at certain periods of the year. Uh, wearables, right? Now, wearables um, technically are defined as any sort of computing device that you can wear. And maybe these uh, you know, ear pods that Apple makes that are popular now is one example. Uh, but wearable clothing is another big thing. So imagine now, um, you have a bunch of sensors measuring things like echocardiogram, the signals from your heart, your pulse, your oxygen saturation, 24-7. Um, athletes use this. People who are recovering in hospitals use this. Uh, so there's a movement called the quantified self movement, and it's the idea that part of your wellness is uh, instrumenting yourself. Now, we're absolutely getting towards that. If you look at things like the Apple Watch and the Garmin Nuvi, a lot of these wrist-worn uh, compute devices are rich with sensors that measure things like ECG, like pulse and oxygen saturation already now. But carry this forward, imagine a t-shirt, kind of like these Under Armour uh, base layers uh, that has sensors in it that are measuring other things about your biometrics. And any physician will tell you that it's the day-to-day 24-7 -day measurement signals that are important in determining uh, whether uh, someone's health status is improving or maybe it's, it's on a trajectory uh, that's degrading. And so there are lots and lots of examples, and I won't belabor the point with all of them, uh, but there's a lot of data all around us. And whether you are in data analytics or some sort of analytical uh, vocation or career after you graduate, and I certainly hope you do, you're going to come in contact with data because right now modern enterprises use a lot of data. Whether you're the airlines, whether you're uh, a supermarket concern, a retail establishment, even a university here at DSU. Um, a couple years ago, an effort was spearheaded uh, to uh, look at all the student data uh, from which high schools kids attended, um, what majors they have, which courses they're taking, and which courses they've had from high school, and so forth. And they have all these different analyses about, for, for example, the probability of graduation in a certain time frame. Right. Uh, and so data is driving a lot of decisions because the beauty of it is that as you collect data along the way and get information, relevant and important information from this data, you have an opportunity uh, to change course if things are going in a direction that you don't want them to go. Right. So, for example, if you recognize the fact, for example, that something's happening with students in a certain major, well, you can now call in the chair of that department and say, hey, and say, hey, what's going on here? Maybe we can make a change to try uh, to improve upon this or uh, push it in a different direction. So, of course, there's a problem. Data is good. You can make a lot of decisions. But as you instrument more and more things uh, to produce data, making sense of all this data becomes a pretty daunting task. Right? And so you can imagine, even if you had three measurements from yourself, like your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, and your pulse. Now imagine, you know, over a population, just even in a small town like Dover, 37,000 or 37, 37,000 people, that's a lot of information. Now, if there was some pollutant in the air and there was a higher incidence of, you know, respiratory illness, you'd notice that the oxygen saturation for people in the, the Dover area codes was starting to decrease, right? The oxygen exchange gets worse if there are pollutants and other things uh, in the atmosphere uh, influencing respiratory uh, illness, like asthma and things like that. Uh, so, but then 
part of the question is what data, what parts of the data do you pay attention to? The more data you have, the more you can tell or discern about what's happening in your system that's instrumented. But also on the flip side, conversely, there's a cost because the more data you have, the harder it is to make sense of that data or to try to identify those portions, relevant portions of the data uh, that are meaningful, right? So how do you make sense of this? Well, one of the things you can do is you can take all this data and you build some models, right? Uh, similar to what we talked about last semester, we focused specifically on models that make use of the tools from probability. Now, one such model is called a classifier, and it takes your raw information, your data, right? Uh, that's the raw thing that comes off of all the instrumentation. Um, it performs some operation on it, bless you, and we'll talk about that. And then perhaps it sorts it into categories. So let's say you have a lot of images and you want to know which images are dog images and which images are cat images. Absolutely, you can do that with certain types of models called classifiers. And we'll cover that um, in the two thirds point uh, roughly of the semester. So one of the first things you do with data uh, is you examine this data. You have to look at it because in order to understand what sort of information is uh, embedded within all of those volumes of data, you have to understand the domain. What produces, what produces this data? Where did it come from? What properties do the things that produce this data have? Because that's going to inform what types of measurements you're going to make in order to extract that small piece of information out of these large volumes of data. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So this is what the topic is primarily for this semester. Uh, and in particular, we're going to deal with something called inference. And I'll explain in a few more slides what uh, exactly that means. But let's first uh, look at some of the important administrative bits and cover uh, the course outline. Now, since you've all had me before, um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because you already know uh, the type of uh, style that I have. And so our goals are to gain mastery uh, with this key topic of data and the analysis of this data. Our focus this semester is going to be on the tools from statistics. So statistics you could think of as the evil twin of probability. Probability talks about models that tell you about how data is produced and you can ask it questions. Statistics says given data that I collect, observations that I make, um, I can pose some functions over this data to gain summaries that tell me things about it. And the important part here is that you can tell things about it with some degree of accuracy uh, without knowing everything about the data, right? That's the beauty of statistics. So we're going to focus this semester on tools from statistics and this idea of trying to generalize uh, from a small view of the data, generalize to the entire uh, population from which the data came is called inference, okay? All right. So today we're going to gain mastery of, of this topic, and regardless of uh, what domain you're interested in and what organization, what ultimate career you want, it's unavoidable. You're going to have to deal with data. So this is a very key topic, especially uh, for all of you since you're just starting out. Uh, it's only going to increase. And so we're going to introduce methods and approaches and tools for inference, and that is the deriving of conclusions based on what is known. And if you do it the quote unquote right way, then the conclusions you derive from those pieces of information that are known, i.e. the samples, you can generalize it well to those things that you haven't yet seen. Okay. Uh, we're going to gain some experience with tools from statistics, and we're going to use the usual approach where I talk about a concept, a method, and then we will prototype it ourselves. Okay. Any questions about this? No? So, of course, um, on purpose, when I designed the sequence of stochastic and data analytics, I wanted to amortize the cost across two semesters, so we're going to use the same tools, and that is MATLAB. When we have the site license, we'll still use that same MATLAB, uh, and we'll still use the same textbook, only we're going to focus on different uh, chapters. Okay? And I'll certainly supplement this uh, with other readings uh, that I'll post on uh, the course Blackboard site. Uh, so congratulations, you're not going to spend more money on books, at least for this class. Okay. So other resources, now statistics is quite old, which is 
nice. There are lots of resources out there. When I was your age, um, we didn't have these resources. You had to park in the library and hope that someone didn't check out the book that you needed. Uh, but there are lots and lots of resources. Uh, statistics is quite old, and I encourage you to use those resources uh, that are available to you. Okay, assessment. And so um, it's fixed grading. Uh, and uh, there's the grading scale, it's the usual thing that you might expect. Uh, and I tried to distribute evenly um, all of the assessment components um, in terms of distribution, uh, because different people have various strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we have two written exams collectively worth 25%. Uh, four projects, um, collectively worth 25%. Three homeworks, collectively worth 25%. Uh, we have a research project and we have a presentation. Uh, class participation counts for 5%. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? All right. So topics. First, we'll talk about terminology uh, to drive home what the point is, and then we'll look at data visualization. And data visualization includes something called features, which is really, really important for automated methods of things like classification and clustering, right? We'll talk a little bit about aspects uh, of machine learning, um, just at a high level. Uh, we'll talk about data representation, how you transform it, visual summary, so-called descriptive statistics, how you distill down data into a number that you can use in a quote-unquote calculus, a way of comparing things. In order to compare things, you need a way to measure things so that you can now say this thing is greater than that thing, right? Uh, and so-called descriptive statistics are one way of doing that. We'll look at sampling uh, distributions and confidence intervals, uh, which will lead on to hypothesis testing. How do you determine whether or not two systems are equivalent? Uh, and then we'll also look at regression, which is a machine learning thing. Uh, predictive analytics, how do you draw a generalization so you can make predictions based on sample measurements, as well as classification and clustering. Um, but I just have to figure out what the domain is going to be for this year's uh, version of the class. Okay. Any questions? No? All right. So time. The usual thing, my policy with time, lecture begins on time. Today, I had to talk to Rasomni. I was four minutes late. Um, so again, it's simple. Come to class on time or don't show up at all. Once the door closes, don't knock on the door. Class has started. And unfortunately, I'm not going to let you in. Okay. This is a policy department-wide. You all are grown. You know the policy right now. All right. So there are certain exceptions that can happen, which I understand things happen. Right? People have jury duty, they get sick, maybe there are family issues, what have you. Um, I only ask that you communicate with me. Right? You're all very good at that, uh, so I don't really have to talk about this too much. All right, how to succeed in this class. Now, whether you know it or not, you know every faculty member in at least this division, this department, uh, wants you to be successful. Sometimes students won't let us help them be successful. And to be successful in my classes, and I'd like to say it generalizes to others, but I'll let other faculty speak for themselves, it's about engagement with the material, about regularly interacting with the material actively and not passively. Spend time every single day. And this thing that I like, I don't need Superman. Uh, be Clark Kent and do your job. Do the everyday boring stuff of just a little bit every single day. You don't have to spend hours on it, but do some every single day. And it's that practice that builds expertise. I like to tell people that, you know, analytical stuff, probability and stats, it's easy. What's hard is programming. Programming changes every five to 10 years. So in your careers, over say a 40 year career, you're gonna have to relearn things about eight times, right? Uh, you learn the math once, and that's set, you're set for your entire career, right? So in that regard, it's a lot easier, but it requires engagement on a daily basis. So the top six reasons that people do not pass my classes, right? And it pains me when I see that. They do not follow instructions. When it says do X, Y, and Z and answer these questions, well, after doing X, Y, and Z, answer those questions, right? Um, it sounds simple, and I know in the heat of the moment, Things happen, maybe you know, forget to answer a question, what have you. Uh, but there are a lot of instances where people lose valuable points because they don't follow instructions. Okay, um, there are times when people just don't attend class. If there are issues, please communicate. Uh, but when you're in class, you're able to hear it, you're able to get uh, questions answered in a way that you can't just by reading the book, 
right? So it's really important to show up. Not reading regularly. It's really important to read the material regularly. In the beginning, it's a little bit more challenging, but as you look at it more and more and more regularly, it gets easier and easier and easier. I promise you that. Uh, don't wait until something is due. Don't wait until the middle or end of the semester to start reading through stuff. Um, do it every single day. Uh, missing assignments. Um, people miss assignments, are zeros recorded, and that makes it harder and harder and harder uh, to be successful. For example, here in the distribution, uh, it says each homework is worth 8.33% each, right? So in the beginning, if someone misses one homework, well, that's now, instead of a possible 100%, the max you'll get is 91.66%, right? So missing two components now, the best you can do is a B instead of an A, right? Don't deprive yourself of success. Make sure you hand in all the assignments. If there are questions, please communicate. I respond very quickly uh, to Slack. Um, I have office hours. If those hours don't uh, work for you, uh, email me and schedule an appointment. I want to help you succeed, but you have to want to help me to help you to succeed, okay? All right, so also, Practicing the material, it's really important to practice it. Don't just watch the material passively. Get a pencil and paper and actually do it yourself. Uh, it's important to get that kinesthetic learning and don't wait till the last minute. That's not the way to conduct yourself in life. You react to things instead of being proactive. You wanna happen to life, not life happening to you, right? Okay, any questions about this? And you know, I'm trying to make this entertaining and stuff like that, but it really pains me <laughs> over the years. Every semester, uh, there are instances where these six points are the reasons why people are not successful, and this is entirely fixable. So please take it to heart, and you don't have to say yes, Dr. Holness. No, it's what you do when you're by yourself. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at policies. The distractions are very bothersome not just to me, but to your classmates. And I take this very seriously. If you look around the room, all the people in the room collectively pay a lot of money for this education, right? And so you are literally taking away from uh, your peers' education when you disrupt the class. Uh, I know things happen, but make sure you get in the practice of turning off your cell phone and limit your side conversation. It's a small room. I can absolutely hear everything you're saying, and so can your peers, right? Do that. Not for me, do that for your peers. So I take this very seriously. I don't take late work, right? It's on time or it's not passed in. Things do happen and I'm very good about accommodating things when serious things happen and people have contacted me in the past about it, I ask you to communicate. That doesn't mean you wait until two minutes before something, say, oh, Dr. Holness, uh, I can't do this, right? Because, you know, certainly it's like, mm, well, I don't really believe you, okay? So watch the noise level. I want this to be interactive. I want this to be fun, but don't take from your peers' education. Okay, now academic dishonesty. It's uncomfortable for me. It's uncomfortable for you. If there are issues, don't bend corners, communicate, right? It's very obvious to me uh, when things happen, okay? All right, any questions about this? No? All right. So let's go on to the substantive material. What is data analytics? It is a science, and we're going to examine data. And the whole purpose for doing that is so you can draw conclusions about information contained within that data. But the problem is you don't have all of the data you need. You want to be able to figure out what it is you can get from that data based on the data that you have. And so this is applied in very many industries, as I said at the outset, everything from power management with electric uh, company, uh, utility companies, on through uh, shopping experiences for vendors and things like that. And so what we want to do with this, uh, as organizations use that, it allows them to disprove certain theories about things and models. So for example, you know, what was the impact of a certain advertisement? What was the impact of a certain coupon? on your revenue, right? Uh, so it's really, really important to all sorts of enterprises what you do with data, this data analytics. And so data analytics is not data mining, it's related, but it's not. In data analytics, we focus on inference. How do you derive 
a conclusion based on what is known. And that what is known is the sample that you have. Now that sample could be one customer purchase record, it could be a temperature measurement, it could be a heart measurement and what have you, right? So that's what we're gonna do this semester. Our focus is on tools that get you to this inference idea, okay? All right, so let's jump in with an example. And, you know, maybe you're going on vacation and you cast your gaze out towards the sea. Sun is setting. You can hear the surf. You hear the birds. Uh, it's very pleasant. And, you know, oftentimes when you're out in nature, you ponder life's mysteries. Like who's better? LeBron James or Michael, I should say Sir Michael Jordan. Now, I'm not much of a basketball fan. I stopped watching basketball last time the Celtics won the championship, so I was done at that point. But nonetheless, you all are too young, and you maybe see it on YouTube. You never had the privilege of seeing Michael Jordan play. It was a thing of absolute beauty. LeBron, eh, he's okay. He does a lot of great things in the community. But I still think Michael Jordan is just superior. He changed the game altogether, and it will never be the same. He hasn't played for 20 years and people are still buying his sneakers. We'll see what happens when LeBron eventually retires. So nonetheless, you might be wondering, who's better? So who thinks Michael Jordan is better? Who thinks LeBron James is better? Who doesn't really care? <laughs> okay, I should have chosen another domain. Okay, so of course they can both fly. Michael Jordan, flew higher than LeBron James, and he can fly further than LeBron James, right? And it's, it was a thing of beauty. No one had ever seen anything like Michael Jordan when he first graduated from UNC. It was just unbelievable. Well, LeBron James has won a lot of accolades, a lot of awards, and a lot of championships. Well, everyone knows that even on his best day, LeBron simply can't be Michael Jordan. He just can't. Are you mad about that? You LeBron fans? No? You should be. You should be. Right? You should be. Absolutely. He's won NCAA college championship. He's won Olympic gold medal. He's won many, many MVPs, many NBA championships. He's won everything you can be won. And he's also very close to being the first sports billionaire. Right? Um, so Michael Jordan is just excellent in every aspect that a basketball player or former basketball player could be. Now, of course, some people like this Kobe Bryant guy. Well, Michael Jordan has won everything, everything that can be won at every level. He's done it. Well, Kobe is just kind of like a, a kid compared to Michael Jordan. But that begets the question. And you're wondering, why am I doing this? Of course, I want to make it entertaining, right? Who's better? How do you measure who's better? What does better mean? So what do you think? What does better mean? What do you think better means in this context for this example? To stats? What stats? What do you mean by stats? No, I know what you mean by stats. What, could you explain what do you mean by stats? How many points? Anything else? How many points? Points are important, yeah, because without points you don't win a game. Okay, that's very good. Anyone else have an opinion? Points? Anything else besides points? No? Yes. The errors, so fewer errors, more errors? Oh, the errors, the context in which they played. Why is that important? What do you think? The rules have changed, okay. And plus different difficulty of different teams, right? The difficulty of schedule. Anything else? Yes? Field goal percentage, so the number of times the ball went in versus attempts made, right? Okay, that's important because if your field goal percentage was higher, you made fewer shots, you're kind of more accurate, right? Okay, Any, anything else? So there's a lot of different things that better means. Which one is more important? Now, of course, without points, you don't win, right? No championships, no trophies, nothing, okay? Without a high field goal percentage, well, it's harder to win, okay? Um, if you have a more difficult schedule, that means you're a stronger team. Sometimes you see the, 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 the East Coast team blow out the West Coast team right, or vice versa, because they're used to playing a more difficult schedule. It all matters. And whenever you see some decision or outcome presented, you should ask yourself, what does this mean, right? How are you measuring better? 
And that applies to basketball. It applies to U.S. News and World Report's college rankings. What does that ranking mean? How do you measure it? And that's what we're really getting at is these measurements. What sort of aspects of the data are you collecting in order to make this generalization of this idea called better? Now, of course, there's all sorts of things you can measure. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just barely a small amount. You could talk about points, as Sia had recommended. You could talk about field goal percentage, as uh, Myron uh, suggested. Uh, you could talk about um, the difficulty of schedule, as Jama has suggested. Right? So all these things and more right? you could use as a way to depict better. Now, certainly, if you're coming up with an evaluation, this person is better, it's important for you to define how you measure better, what aspects of this data you're highlighting in order to determine this idea of better. So it could be impact on the team, because Michael Jordan didn't win a championship until Scottie Pippen and Paxson and a couple other tools were there, right? A couple other player important pieces were there. One person does not win championships, right? Uh, so this idea of better it's important to understand what measurements you're making, what questions uh, you're asking, okay? Now, of course, you might say LeBron is better because, right? I might say Michael Jordan is better because, but the underlying idea here is that it's important to define that answer to because. Why is this person better? How are you measuring this idea of better? Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so of course, statistics provide us a tool uh, for making very quick comparisons. Because if you wanted to compare uh, LeBron to Michael Jordan, you would absolutely take a look at the entire body of work. Now, of course, that body of work would mean all of the game videos that LeBron, in which LeBron has played, and you just have video after video after video because that represents all of his body of work. Now, certainly, if this is a written accord to have all this video, that takes a lot of space and a lot of time uh, to write down, right? Because he's played many hundreds of hours worth of video uh, in the game. Now, Michael Jordan, of course, you could look at his body of work and you'd have to have all of this game film, not only from the pros, but also from the Olympics, as well as from college, to show his body of work, right? And that, as well, is a really, really big volume of work. So, of course, you say, gosh, well, given all of this data, I want to make it easy for me. And statistics is the tool that we use to provide a very concise summary of all the hundreds of hours of video that you would collect uh, from Michael Jordan. Okay, so instead of having hundreds of hours worth of video, we're going to collapse all of this information down into a single number, and that single number is called a statistic. A statistic is nothing more than the outcome of a function that you measure over this data. So every time Michael Jordan shoots the ball and gets uh, points, you add that up, uh, the number of points total, uh, you might report that as a quality measure points, uh, or you might say the average number of points in a game, right? That is a statistic. It's a single number, the result of some function that summarizes all this complex information from the hundreds of hours of videos for this example into a single number, and now you can use it to make comparisons. Who has the higher average number of points, for example? So you might be asking yourself, at least for the game of basketball, how in the world do they do this? Well, let me show you. Sitting at the game, either at or behind uh, the game desk, um, you have some people whose job it is, is to collect statistics, right? They're statisticians. They do this at the college level. Uh, they do it at the professional level, right? And so these statisticians uh, will be tasked with how many field goal percentages, how many fouls, and all those other measurements from the game, and they collect them. And you can actually go on the website for the NBA and actually uh, look up a player and look at all these stats in their uh, glorious details. Now, of course, then you have people like uh, Kevin, right? He's an alum. Uh, he took my course. And this is an example of uh, letting your passion uh, guide your career choice. Um, he was just a basketball fanatic 
and he took offense when I said Michael Jordan is better than LeBron, but we'll talk about that another time. He's a statistics auditor for the National Basketball Association. And so what he does is he takes these stats and he reviews them and he does some analysis to make sure uh, those stats are sound. And so if you're interested in uh, sporting and it doesn't have to be basketball, it could be anything, it could be professional lacrosse, it could be soccer, whatever, um, I encourage you to just go out there and try it, do it. Right? A lot of internships out there as well. And so that's just my plug to say that there are a lot of opportunities to use this sort of discipline in all sorts of ways. And Kevin uh, is a shining example of that. Okay. So what does a statistic do? A statistic helps you to process data. Okay. It's a function. That function inputs some aspect of the data and outputs a single number. And it allows you to answer interesting and important questions. Who's better? who had a bigger impact. But it's still very important when you do this to understand the data, right? Data is the fundamental part of a statistic. Now, the data is the raw material of the knowledge, right? You're trying to discern something from all of this, uh, an example of basketball, these hundreds of hours of game film. Uh, you're trying to discern something, uh, and that raw material is your data. And the statistic helps you condense it down into a very compact description, i.e. a single number, that allows you to make comparisons and to make generalizations about things. It allows you to describe uh, that particular uh, aspect of the data. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So one such comparison is who's better. But again, you have to decide what measurements are important measurements for your particular statistic that you're reporting, okay? All right, so let's continue. Now, certainly sports can be lucrative, both in terms of entertainment and business and the merchandising, uh, as well as legal gambling. Uh, but let's consider another statistic, something called the Gini uh, Index. Now, the Gini Index is something from economics, and it's used on a national level for a particular country, and it's used to measure something uh, akin to statistical uh, dispersion uh, variance that we talked about last semester, but it's a little bit different. It's used specifically to measure economic disparity, so it pertains particularly to money and the distribution of money within individuals in a population. And so when one accumulates wealth, there are three prime ways, at least in the U.S., uh, in which people accumulate wealth. One is employment, right? So you work uh, and uh, you get money in exchange for that work, right? Uh, labor for uh, value, okay? Uh, inheritance. So inheritance could be um, assets like real estate, collectibles, or money, right? And so inheritance uh, or so-called intergenerational transfer of wealth, it allows that wealth to grow over multiple lifetimes, right? Uh, then there's also investments, right? The passive thing. You park your money into some product and that product uh, is invested. And as that investment pays off and grows, so too uh, does your money. And so these three ways are primarily, these three um, uh, categories are the primary ways in which wealth is accumulated. Now, of course, for every accumulation of wealth, some individuals in a population might accumulate a certain amount of wealth and others might accumulate a different amount of wealth. So this Gini index is a statistic and it ranges uh, in the values on the real number line between zero and one. And when a Gini index is zero, that corresponds to identical wealth in all households. That means everyone has the same wealth in a population. When the Gini index conversely uh, ranges on the high side to one, that corresponds to a single household having all the wealth. So with a single household having all the wealth, that would mean a single household or family owns everything, right? Now, of course, for any country or municipality, you don't want the extremes. You want the Gini index to sit somewhere in between on this interval. And bad things can happen on either extreme if the Gini index is zero or if the Gini index is one. Now, of course, some would argue uh, if a Gini index moves closer towards zero and it does change every year, it's reported on an annual basis, then there's no incentive for people to take risk and to work to try to build more wealth. If a Gini index swings towards one, you get unrest. You have sort of like land barons and people eventually get so frustrated, there are uprisings and there's total chaos, right? 
Um, here's the Gini index. I forgot the year. I think it was 2015 or so uh, for a number of different countries. So in Sweden, um, the Gini index is closer to zero. It's 0.23. Um, in um, South Africa, the Gini index is 0.65, is closer to one. Right. So you have a, a smaller number of families that have much more wealth. Uh, there's more disparity. The United States is right around 0.5, but you know it swings up and down depending on economic conditions and things like that. Okay. Any questions about this? So you might wonder, why do I care about the Gini index? Well, governments care about the Gini index because they use this uh, to determine uh, what services should be output. So for example, the Small Business Administration, the SBA. The SBA is tasked with growing business and their focus more often than not is small business because without small business, you don't get big business. Google is a juggernaut and they started out as a small business, right? And small business in the United States is the primary employer collectively of workers uh, of employment age in the United States. And small business can mean anything from a software company to a corner store to a construction company, what have you. And so something like the SBA would say, okay, gosh, well, wealth is being concentrated on a smaller number of families. We want to make sure we can drive that Gini index a little bit closer to zero or you know, down. So we're gonna do things to try to get people to start more businesses, all right? Because one of the ways you can accumulate wealth is starting businesses. Housing. Now, one of the sources of wealth in the United States is housing, right? You have to pay to live somewhere. And if you're gonna pay to live somewhere, you might as well own it. And so um, housing administration on a federal level uh, uses the Gini index to create programs to try to uh, increase home ownership. Because someone owns a home, they pass it on to their children, and that is one way in which uh, families accumulate wealth from one generation to the next. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? And so things like the Gini index um, are computed regularly by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, in the federal government, and many government agencies use this, among other things, uh, to influence uh, decisions, okay? which is why the US Census is so important, which is uh, going to be done this year. It's done every decade. Uh, any questions about this? Does that make sense? So you know, we talked about who's better, Michael Jordan or LeBron, and this is the Gini index, and the consequences are very serious uh, for statistics like this. OK, so there are different types of statistics. Uh, there are so-called descriptive statistics, and a descriptive statistic uh, is a number uh, that summarizes or describes the data. Things like averages that we talked about or means, uh, those are descriptive statistics. Uh, things like variance or the dispersion, those are so-called descriptive statistics, and we'll expand upon different types of descriptive statistics. Then there's something called inferential statistics. Uh, an inferential statistic is a conclusion reached based on evidence and reasoning. So you gather some samples, you do some functions on those samples, and you reason from those samples, applying that result uh, to the general population. Uh, risk assessment is another type of statistic. In risk assessment, you analyze things that can go wrong, and then you associate uh, this go wrong uh, as being things that are more likely to go wrong or things that are less likely to go wrong. And then often in the insurance industry, they associate a price with this, and that's how you pay insurance or how they determine what rates you should pay, right? Um, identification of relationships. When we talked about correlation, that's one such identification of relationship. How tightly coupled are two different types of measurements? And you can these relationships can be direct or they can be indirect. For example, um, the relationship between the price of gas and uh, an Xbox, for example. You might wonder, gosh, well, oh, sorry, the price of oil uh, and an Xbox. You might wonder, gosh, well, what's the relationship? Well, most goods and services are transported via truck, right, cross country. And as the cost of oil goes up, so too goes the cost of gasoline. And if gas is uh, more expensive, it'll cost more to ship things, and that price uh, is passed on to the consumer as you go across the supply chain. Um, that's both the raw materials as well as the finished durable goods. And so definitely there's a relationship between the price of oil and the cost of goods, uh, both durable as well as uh, perishable. Okay. All right. Any questions about this?
So let's take a look briefly at descriptive statistics. Um, it's a concise uh, summary, uh, and it allows you to distill down a bunch of data into one number or set of numbers. Now, of course, when you distill down data, you're summarizing, and in summarizing, you're also throwing things away. Now, the key in a descriptive statistic is to choose the right thing to summarize. Because you're throwing away information when you produce a summary, i.e. a descriptive statistic, you could throw away the wrong thing and make an incorrect statement. And so we'll talk about descriptive statistic as it pertains uh, to populations. So what is left when you produce a summary, the things you don't throw away, it should reasonably depict what it is you're illustrating about the data. So for example, let's say you, know, you had a campaign and you uh, did some advertising and you said uh, to your employer, maybe you work for corporate office for some organization, you said, ah, the result of this advertising campaign was a 100 increase, 100% 100 increase uh, in sales. Okay, well, that's a good descriptive statistic, the increase in sales. But if someone asks you how many people bought the product and you said two, well, two is not a lot of people. How many bought it before the coup before the advertising? Only one bought it, right? So of course, yeah. If one bought it before and two bought it after, that is a 100% increase in sales, but the number of people who bought it is not meaningful, right? So it's really important you choose the right descriptive statistic. And it has been said there are three things in life, lies, damn lies, and statistics. A statistic can be used to deceive, right, on purpose. So if I tell you there's a 100% increase in sales, right, or for example, in our department, there was a 66% increase uh, in computer science majors uh, for incoming freshmen, right? The first question you should ask, how many freshmen, right? Um, to ask if this question or this statistic is meaningful. So it's really important to know when you produce a statistic to understand if it's the quote unquote right thing that you're um, uh, describing, okay? All right, so things like batting average, which is the percentage of at-bats in baseball for which you hit the ball, right? You actually connect the ball and grade point average. These are descriptive statistics and people accept them, but what these things don't talk about for the batting average, what's the difficulty of the pitch? Some pitches are easier to hit than others. Likewise, for grade point average, what is the difficulty of the course in the curriculum? Because the GPA doesn't talk about course difficulty. And so often say, for example, for grad school, and I hope you all apply for grad school, one of the things they look, look at are courses in that major. So for example, for computer science grad school, we look at GPA, but we also look at the courses that are computer science courses. How do you do in those, right? So these two descriptive statistics, uh, batting average and GPA, they don't talk about those other uh, aspects. So it's really important when you pose a statistic to know what it is you're throwing away and ask yourself if the statistic is depicting correctly what you're trying to say about the data uh, that you have, okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? All right, so inferential statistics. Now, inference uh, talks about the following problem. Let's say you have a survey, and the survey is about the homeless population. Maybe you're a municipality, and you want to administer services, you have a fixed budget, and you want to administer services for the homeless population. Now, of course, you want to understand what the homeless population is, who these people are in your city. And for a survey about the homeless, it's very expensive, right? Because you have to dispatch people to find uh, the homeless and ask them questions. And it's logistically impossible. You can't find every single homeless person in the city. As much as you'd want to try, you're not going to find them all. So what do you do? Well, you can use data to make an informed conjecture or guess about a larger question even if you don't have all the full information associated with that question. So you have the quote unquote known world, right? That's the information you have. And what this inference does is it produces an answer that's applicable to things that you don't know. So you don't know what the entire homeless population is, but what you do know is that subset of the homeless population that you can contact and issue surveys to, okay? All right, so for example, how do you do this? By sampling. You gather data for a small amount of your data, 
across certain categories, and this is an important aspect, and those categories should be representative of what you think the structure of that unknown population is. So let's take an example, and you use these samples to make judgments through summaries uh, for those samples across that population, and you generalize it to the entire population. So this is a depiction of the homeless population, and this is merely just an example of the population of homeless in Dover. So you have a group, and we're going to illustrate sampling, and let's just assume that these uh, of this homeless population, they are non-overlapping. That's absolutely not the case in reality, but just for the sake of example, we're going to assume that they don't overlap. So one group are the homeless veterans, right? It's a real problem, right? Still, many cities across the country, it shouldn't happen. Um, another group of homeless population, um, you take the veterans and then you sample them, right? You um, find homeless veteran and you ask him or her a question, right? Uh, another group are homeless families. Again, it shouldn't happen, uh, but there are entire families that are homeless. And in fact, it's really hard uh, to find family shelters and housing, emergency sheltering uh, for homeless families. So typically, in practice, as I've learned, what happens uh, is that um, they have women's shelters, which allow children, uh, and then uh, the uh, male, if there is a male in the homeless family, has to go find someplace else to live, right? And of course, as a family unit, it's really important for all sorts of reasons uh, to keep a family unit together, right? So nonetheless, let's assume we also have fa homeless families. We identify a homeless family, and we pull that uh, sample, and then we ask uh, the family questions. They're also uh, drug addicted, which is another segment of the homeless population. And again, I'm assuming these are non-overlapping groups, which is not the case in reality. You sample one and or a couple, and you ask the questions uh, in a survey. Uh, and then lastly, uh, aged out foster children. Uh, when you turn 18, you're considered an adult in the eyes of the law. But, you know, uh, as a foster child, when you age out, now you're on your own. Right. And many of them who have aged out of the foster, system, foster care system uh, are homeless. Uh, and let's say that's the last segment of the population. Uh, you sample one, ask questions. OK, so in this example, we have a population and we made an assumption about the structure of this population, a so-called hierarchical population. In this particular case, the groups or subgroups in this hierarchy, they do not overlap. Is that the case in reality? Absolutely not, but this is a simplification uh, for educational reasons. So now you have these samples, and I only depicted sampling one, but you'd certainly sample multiple to get uh, a better idea of what's going on with your homeless population. And then assuming that your samples are representative of this population, you now ask questions. So you might ask questions like, what is the average age? So you're going to collect the ages uh, of these individuals. Uh, what is the length of homelessness? How long have they been homeless? What is the health status? Are there health issues? Um, and what is the level of education? That's another thing they like to ask. And so, for example, average age. If, depending on this average age, you might try to find a supportive kin uh, nearby in the local municipality or maybe in neighboring municipalities. If someone is relatively young, they might have an aunt or uncle or cousin or brother or sister who's still around or someplace accessible. And often, as uh, more the case, maybe they're not aware that their kin is homeless, right? Uh, length of homelessness, perhaps it's a housing solution, right? Uh, unstable housing, so having housing solutions. Uh, health status, uh, the administration of medical services, mental services, or drug treatment. Level of education, maybe it's job training or job placement issue. Now, of course, when you take these samples, you ask your questions, now you can administer budgets to best serve uh, your particular homeless population. Now, certainly, this is some measurement that you'd want to take every single year or maybe multiple times a year to get a good idea. But the main point I want to um, uh, drive home here is that you're never going to find every single member of this population. Right? The best you can do is sample, so you design from what you understand about the problem what you think the population looks like, and then you go out and find people representative from each of these categories. You ask these questions, pose your summaries, and then you use these summaries uh, to administer policies and uh, to allocate budgets. Okay? Um, any questions about this? Does that make sense?
So of course, data analytics is really, really important. And it's very important to get this right. Because in this example, if you make a mistake, now you won't be serving well uh, the population uh, of need. Okay. All right. So some of the questions you might, or concerns you might have, do you have enough samples from each of the categories of homeless? Right? So maybe one segment of the population uh, is the majority of the population and the others are relatively small. So do you have enough samples to adequately represent what's really happening? Are the categories appropriate? So for example, are aged out foster children, are they drug addicted as well? Right? Is this the right design for a population? And I know for a fact it's not, but it's just for uh, an example. Right? Um, are you measuring useful attributes? Is length of homelessness a useful thing to measure? So that gets to what's called survey design. Are you using the appropriate measures? Should I say average or should I say minimum or maximum or something else, right? Or the increase in the average from one year to the next of measuring this. And so there are lots and lots of questions when you talk about performing inferential statistics. And a lot of those have to do with designing your experiments appropriately. How do you structure your population in this example? And where do you place your samples? How many samples do you place? Right? These are all very relevant and important uh, questions. So let me check the time, 10.35. Okay, and so the beauty of sampling is that it allows us, if we have a fixed number of resources, it allows us um, to, uh, to still go forward. So for example, let's say you know, you're the mayor or city manager uh, and you, know, you only have so much money uh, to hire people to go out and survey the homeless population. You can only afford, let's say, each person can work a certain amount of time based on the money you have, and you can only afford, say, a thousand samples, right? Uh, so now you can decide where to place your samples uh, based on the resources you have, and then make informed decisions. And so there's an organization called Gallup, and they take what are called the Gallup polls, and they're a professional surveying um, organization. And so people hire Gallup uh, to get information about all sorts of things, customer behavior, um, all sorts of things. You can Google search Gallup. Um, so what Gallup determined that if you contact a thousand households, that produces the same result as if you, uh, if you, if you contacted every household. Now they have some analysis that speaks to that, but that's just what Gallup says. Others might disagree. Okay, so Gallup did a study called the State of the American Workplace Report uh, for the years from 2010 to 2012. And what they found that 70% of US workers uh, were not engaged at work. Now, let me ask you, if you read this headline, what would you ask about this study? What would you ask about this study? Any ideas? Where they're working? Okay, and why would that be important? What do you think? Mm -hmm. It's like satisfaction with the job. Okay, and did you know that the construction industry has very high satisfaction because you see the result of what you're doing? Dentists have very low satisfaction jobs because everyone hates the dentist, right? Well, maybe you like the dentist. A lot of people hate the dentist. So there are some jobs, um, I know police officers, that's not a fun job because people aren't really happy to see you every time you, you know, contact someone. And like Burger King, like you said, so one of the questions is which jobs, right? Is it a thankless job or is it a job where people get high satisfaction? Okay. Anything else? Yes. The hours. Ah, that's an important one. Uh, why do you think that's important? What would you say? What are the issues associated with hours versus during the day? Mm-hmm. 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 Yes. And also, working overnight um, is not always the best for your health, right? Um, because human beings are made to rest at night and, uh, you know, be around in the, uh, up and about in the morning because access to sunlight really is important. Um, and also the engagement with people at work, if you're solitary versus interacting with people. Um, okay, anything else? What about the length of time someone has been working there, right? 
because it's easy if you're working someplace for a long time to get kind of bored with it. Oh, I'm so tired of coming into this job. I don't say that because I have all these wonderful, bright and eager students all the time. Um, but anyways, um, length of time. What about the age of the worker? Right. So, you know, when you're young and, you know, you're in your first job. And I remember my first job out of undergrad. Everything was wonderful and new and exciting. And then over time, you kind of, ah, OK. And then usually if you look at people on LinkedIn, you'll notice every two or three years they change jobs. Right. And that's because they get kind of tired of doing it. Because let's say you worked at iRobot. I have a good friend who works at iRobot. Um, you know, you're working on robot vacuums and, you know, depending on what you're doing, you're like, oh, this is, this is kind of neat. But after like four, five years of doing the same thing, 40, 50 hours a week for five years, yet two, maybe three weeks of vacation a year, you're kind of like, I need to do something else. So you notice after a certain amount of time, you kind of want to switch, right? It's not like at college where you get to do all these different subjects. You're just doing one thing again and again. If you are working on the spell checker at Microsoft, on Microsoft Word, that's what you do. And after a while, I'd imagine working on spell check gets kind of tired, right? And you want to do something else. You want to work on grammar check, right? Or something else altogether uh, different. So they didn't talk about any of that. And so this is just to say, um, whenever you see any type of statement, whether it's a poll for politics since it's an election year, it's just a Gallup poll, or any statistic, a ranking of things, you need to ask yourself those underlying questions about how they design the sampling and the survey. And you can ask yourself, do you agree with the, those samples? Um, you know, I think Michael Jordan is better. Maybe you think LeBron is better. And we can argue and discuss about the experiments and why those are the right experiments. You should always question every statistic you see and ask yourself how they designed the sampling and whether or not you accept the outcome and if those samples are measuring the right things um, by your definition, okay? Uh, because I can use statistics, other people can use statistics all the time to sway opinion, you should always exercise a healthy dose of skepticism and ask yourself, how did they design that experiment? Okay. Uh, because, you know, people make mistakes, yes, but people can also willfully try to deceive you or sway opinion based on that. So for example, you know, people say, uh, there was one stat that said, oh my gosh, in 2020, the economy is slowing down. Ah! Right. Well, the economy in 2019 was on a tear. You can't expect a company's growth to be 30% like it was in 2019 every single year. So if we went from, okay, well, how much are they growing now? Maybe now they're growing 20% versus 30%. 20% growth is still pretty darn good. It is slowing down because it's no longer 30%, but you need to kind of peel back the layers and ask yourself those questions about how they designed the experiment to get those samples. What questions are they asking? Because it's important to ask the right questions and important to decide whether or not you accept those questions as being faithful measurements of the points that this outcome is trying to make. Okay. Any questions about that? So, you know, I encourage you uh, to go out and look at various surveys. Sample polls are all over the place. And they usually, if they're honest, provide a methodology section where they describe how they make this measurement. So when U.S. News and World Reports talks about college rankings, one of the um, things they look at in the methodology section is the rate of alumni giving. Now, you might say, what does alumni giving have to do with the quality of a college education? I don't know. <laughs> but you have to decide whether or not you agree with that. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. So we will pick back up uh, on uh, Thursday. Uh, with the balance of this and keep going forward. Uh, so um, please do take a look at the homework, uh, the project, I mean, it's on Blackboard. Uh, look at it right away, and I will see you all on uh, Thursday.